Welcome to The Advocates, your Sunday reminder that important conversations are amongst the necessary tools for a saner society. Today, I'm pointing my spotlight on the religiosity of Nigerians, Christians and Muslims who holy pass. Raymond's focus is on youth empowerment. As always, discussions around our mental health are always welcome. So Ejimai is saying today that suicide is never an option. Baba Shola, who joins us for the first time today, talks about the struggle of new political parties in Nigeria. And finally, Kingsley is back again and is here to reveal to us who Nigeria's enemy is. As always, your panelists are here to share ideas aimed at provoking thoughts with no holds barred. Stay with us. Nigeria's religiosity, Islam or Christianity, which one better pass? As a religious people, sharply divided along religious lines, at least that is what we are made to believe, many have queried the impact and influence of religious bodies on the total growth of the nation. Rather than engage in a cycle of blame game, the major question should be, one, in a nation where we claim to be Christians and Muslims, Premium Times reports that in 2016, Nigerians spent over 208 billion naira on alcohol for consumption. This total amount was higher than the budget of Hondo State for that year. <laughs> we have a market so vibrant that major, Ghan uh, major Ghanaian alcohol beverages are selling millions of bottles in Nigeria annually. Yet, both major religious, religions rather, frown at alcoholism. Yet, the gods are not to blame. We remain a major market for the sale of condom. Society for Family Health says Nigerians use an estimated 400 million condoms annually. And believe me, we could have sold more, but for the fact that many people see condom as a hindrance to total pleasure. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. You call a Christian businessman in church, and he will bluntly lie to you, telling you he's in Oklahoma when in reality is in the heart of Okokomaiko, somewhere in Lagos. During Ramadan, a Muslim brother tells someone, Ma bimini nuni si yo, mo 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 bawe, tin bag bawe ton, to ba ba mi don wo, ma bat yeje. That means don't get me angry now I'm fasting. When I'm done fasting, I will destroy you. So what is the essence of the fasting? When you're saving the best for the last. When you, when you, when you read both holy books, None of it encourages what is happening in Nigeria presently. I listened to a Muslim cleric speak during a TV interview over the weekend. He says the Quran states that before you choose a leader, such a person must be trustworthy, honest, and capable. I mean, and a lot of other qualities. In Titus 1, verse 7 and 8, it describes a leader as someone who is not arrogant, quick-tempered, a drunkard, uh, violent, or greedy for gain. But someone who is hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So if both books put such huge demand on leadership, why then are we plagued with successive bad leadership? Why do our leaders who, who, who hold fast to their faith continue to work in contravention of the words of God? Our problem in Nigeria is not religion. Our problem is the wrong application of the dictates of our religion. Our problem is that we have turned our back on the foundation of religious beliefs. We have, we have hijacked processes from God. We then turn around and blame the church or the mosque for the failures of our society. We have allowed politicians and our selfish interests falsely divide us along religious lines. But when we have personal needs, we do not care about religion. When you take someone to the hospital, how many of us demand to see a doctor, nurse, or even a surgeon that practices our religion? So I ask, if we don't care about religion of, I mean, when we're getting artisans or professionals to provide a service for us, which is more personal to us, why then should we care about religion of our leader and ignore his qualities? Leadership is not about religion. It is about the qualities that God needs to advance its course for a people at a particular time. 
the hypocrisy of it beats me. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> let me finish my fasting. When I am done, I will destroy you, you Danny. I, I will you. destroy you. you really oh my God. <laughs> you know, that really caught me. You know, the person I, 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 that really got me thinking was the statistics you gave about the, the alcohol, alcohol consumption, really? you know, oh where the majority no. of, of course, these two religions... So who is are, drinking it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> we, we are spending so much money, like, mm -hmm. more than a state government's budget, budget within a period. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But you get into these spaces, and these guys are telling you that nobody, we don't drink this, and they even swear that they don't <laughs> drink alcohol. <laughs> so where is this thing going to, and then... The statistics about the usage of condom, 400 million. Yeah. Yeah. At and least we thank God that they are using it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Inadequately, okay. though. But. Yeah. So, so, but, but again, there's something I also uh, you know, saw there when he said that some people are beginning to hijack processes from God. Yeah. You know, taking the whole tenets of religion, uh, focusing more on the religious aspect of people's life instead of their qualities exactly. also. Mm -hmm. Because when you have people that are not in any of these religions mm -hmm. and they are ex doing exceptionally well when True. they are giving responsibilities to take care of things. Mm -hmm. So what do you now say? Are you now saying it's because he's not uh, reading the Quran or it's because he's not reading the Bible? Where is he actually getting that? So it means that mm -hmm. he's focusing more on something deeper than those of us that have actually moved, maybe those, those of them that have actually hijacked the process from God are trying to help God. <laughs> you know, I think we place too much emphasis on the religion. And over yeah. time, unfortunately, I've had experiences whereby somebody tells me, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm very religious, and I'm very Christian, like I go to church all the time. Then you find out that the person's um, behavior does not you know, reflect it's any God-like exactly. yeah, characteristics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. at, at a point in time, I had this stuff. And one day I asked her, oh, you're so early. She was like, yeah, yes. I go to church at 5.30 in the morning before coming to work. And at that point, I was like, And it was really? like, like a point. Yeah. And I was like, really? Are you that oh. holy? And of course. It doesn't reflect she in She had duty. issues with poor customers. <laughs> at that point, I had to ask her that. Going to church at 5.30 a.m. and being rude to customers is contradictory. It's supposed to come out with it. Personally, I, I consider Nigeria's religiosity a disability. Mm. Oh, true. A national disability. And there are a number of reasons for that. I think most times the political class hide under the guise of religion to perpetuate atrocities, right? But beyond hiding under the guise of religion to perpetuate atrocity, you discover yeah. that people also have soft spots for people on the basis of religious religion. affiliation. That is it. And that most is painfully, it. the fact that we wait for God to do the things we should do for That's ourselves. Right. Yeah. Instead of fixing our country, we are praying, right? Yeah, that is it. We are I, not driving innovation I, I don't know and what doing a lot of things. thinking where it is in the UK. Maybe they are not as religious or they have another approach to it. What do you think? Well, uh, for me, I, I, I'm someone who, people who follow me on social media, you know, I talk about religion a lot, um, is that, like, like she said, that, um, you know, we are religious people, but we don't, there's no, we, we, don't, we don't practice religion. We, if you were looking at data and statistics, they probably tell you Nigeria is the most religious country in the world. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But when, we, when it comes to what obtained on the ground, when we interact with each other, you don't see that, that you know, the, the love that religion preaches. At yes. least I know that the Christian religion preaches about love a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't see that love, you know, manifesting in our everyday lives. And it's yes. quite a disappointment. And as, as is rightly said, religious, uh, religion is something that political politicians hide behind these yeah. days to perpetrate all sorts of injustices. Yeah. Uh, and, and so for me, I think, you know, both religions, I think it, it, it really falls down to the people that preach religion. Mm. I think they're, they're doing a disservice to humanity by not telling their followers to actually, you know, obey those tenets that religion, uh, you know, they're preaching in, in religious uh, circumstances. Yes, yeah. And, yeah. And you're very right. And I think the major problem we have with religion that I see in our part of the world is that we have the saying that it's, don't judge me, I know my God. You mm. see, I always tell people that religion is, it starts as a personal journey. But it doesn't end as a personal journey. If you really are a Christian, everybody around you should be able to testify. Without yeah. knowing it's that you're actually... It's not saying I know my yeah. God. No, your you behavior, must have your behavior. speak for yourself, for you. You're preaching it. Yeah. So it's, it, you don't need to now tell me I'm a Christian, I preach in church. No, I should say to you and ask, you, what uh, church do you yeah, attend? Yeah, 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 no, it's right true. That is the major thing. So religion is just a comfortable corner for us to hide. 
and do a lot of things. All right. <laughs> Up next is Raymond and his advocacy on youth empowerment. Stay tuned. Youth employability and empowerment, panacea for sustainable economic growth. Africa's population has grown to over 800 million in the last 50 years and is estimated to grow to over 1.8 billion in the next 50 years. By 2050, one fourth of the world's population will be African. Given the statistics, Africa is the only continent where the youth population is significantly expanding. The history of the world's progress reveals that youth have been the front line agents of every facet of change and the powerhouse of industrial world. Africa needs an army of courageous youth who can turn challenges into big time opportunities in the various fields of life. Youth is not a number, but a window of opportunity that closes with each passing day. It is actually a very important season whose outcome usually determines the rest of a person's life. Hence, if an individual doesn't know why he or she is a youth now, there is the tendency of abusing and not using it to their advantage. The vision of a nation lies in the hands of the youth. They are filled with tremendous and towering ambitions. It will be a great wastage of human resources if these youths are not allowed to exercise their talents and God-given potentials. The entire success of a nation depends on young people, but in order for a sustained success, it is the government's responsibility to provide the youth with proper facilities for getting uh, equipped with the knowledge of the modern era. However, the youth cannot continue waiting for the government forever. The current surge of innovations, especially in the tech world, has proven that with determination and focus, the average youth will be shocked at what he can achieve, leveraging on the advantages of the technological industries. There is a rising tide of entrepreneurship sweeping across Africa, and the young stars are riding it vigorously. A growing number of young Africans are not just content waiting around for the proper career bump up the establishment ladder. No. Their ambitions are much more profound. They are setting out to write their destinies, establishing remarkable enterprises that will transform Africa and reignite its economies. The youth of today are able to determine what kind of investments are made, what kind of jobs are created, what type of goods are produced, and what knowledge they pass on to others. Youth represent the chance to diversify the country's economy towards a more sustainable path Harnessing new technology, the internet, new service, and new ways of working and communicating with others. With the youth comes energy, innovation, op and optimism. If there are supportive environments and opportunities, which I believe are being made available by the speed of development across all sectors through digital transformation. In summary, it is high time African youth stop seeing life and start giving life. They must start questioning the status quo. There is the urgent need to start challenging every form of routine that has not contributed in any form to solving social problems. If we, if we can think more about our capacity to take more steps and produce results, then we will be amazed at how much we can achieve in our time. Wow. Interesting. Oh, that's deep. Uh, hear, that's very close to my heart uh, because I've always, always been a youth champion. Uh, it's not because I look like a youth myself, <laughs> really? but it's because I, I believe that um, when you when you talk to children, if you if you brought say twelve children from across the world into a room and you had a discussion with them about something as simple as their country's politics or economy, it'd be you know, it's quite, um, it will be quite alarming to see the kind of things that, you know, the Nigerian youth will be able to talk about. Um, while children who are in more developed societies, who are empowered at a very young age to start to think for themselves, to start to begin to align, you know, they, they, they don't, I can't tell my children what to study, for instance, in university. They've already made up their minds or they are about to make up their minds. And it's based on their strengths, based on, their interests. And I think one of the key things is that, you know, the generation that will run the country in the next five or 10 years is this generation, whether you like it or not. You can see what's happening with the tech sector in Nigeria. 
sure. with companies who I had never heard of uh, or heard much of. Now raising funds, two hundred million dollars in mm -hmm. international world, mm -hmm. and it just goes to show you that there's so much that the young people have in their minds. If you look at generational gaps as well, look at how your father or my father would relate to a, a mobile phone, and look at what things he would be doing with mobile phone. Then look at how I would use it. Then look at how my child would use it. Maybe my seventeen-year-old, and then look at how a baby who has who is probably maybe a toddler who is probably just about one how they can figure out these things. It just shows to, it goes to show you that even without being around in the world for so long, the young people have a, an opportunity to grasp everything that's before them. Mm. And you know, so they, that generation cannot be ignored. And it is very key that they're developed from a very early age, you yeah. know, from like when they're in nursery yeah. school and primary school. Yeah. Not just to be learning, I mean, Nigeria would like to force knowledge down a lot, but more to be able to find out what their strengths are and be able to develop them along those strengths. That, that's good. Um, I will always say that Nigeria is the richest country in the world when it comes to the abundance of human and material resources. Oh, okay, we have them in abundance. The problem is that Nigeria is at best an incubation for greatness, but it's not a habitat. Oh, true. Mm. Yeah. Right? It's that not a habitat. Just expelling anything good. Yeah. So you see a lot That's of a young people truth. trying to make giant strides with visions and plans, but the system keeps frustrating the innovation and creativity in them. Mm. And that is why brain drain remains a challenge. Absolutely. So the problem is not, okay, do we have potentials? Are the youth future leaders of tomorrow? Yeah, yes, they are. But what does the system do? The system stifles that youthfulness in you and leaves you with the grand vision of a Canadian passport. I'm telling you. <laughs> How did you slide that in there? <laughs> plan B, like hey, Pastor plan B. That's the plan B. The grand vision of a plan B. Yeah. 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 Painful, because actually. once you share 200 million Canadian passports, Nigeria will be empty. Uh, but it's only a matter of time <laughs> before exactly. we all come yeah. back. Yeah. We all come back. But another yeah. thing that's like quite worrisome when we talk about youth employment and uh, empowerment is when you drive around with Lagos and you see these able bodied young men. Mm. Littering everywhere mm. during the day, working hours. You are going to a meeting, and you look out of the, out of your car, and you see these young men just by the road, completely wasting away their time. And I'm wondering, can the government do more? Can the government give more? Provide mm. opportunities for these guys to multiply right. yeah. themselves. It's painful yeah. because yeah. that's our future, yeah. Yeah. right by the side of the road. So when yeah. somebody goes through the university. And then the person is, uh, the person have, you've graduated, you know, gone through all the stress of our education system by itself, and now you don't have options, and you mm -hmm. must have to survive. So mm -hmm. that's where you have to see those people that they can't die in their house. Yeah, well, and yeah. just like a friend said earlier, you wanted to die where people will see him. So some of these people have to <laughs> stay outside where they have to, <laughs> you know, to find a way to survive where people can see them. But you see, in my view, I, I think when we talk about the youth, I have this bittersweet feeling about them. Because in one breath, you have a lot of guys doing great things in the tech industry, in true, banking. True. We have exactly. CUDA, we have a lot of big yeah. banks yeah. online now. It's an innovation. Yeah. Some of us never even imagined we could have online banks. Yeah. Yeah. When it first came out, I'm like, where is your head, head office? I need to go and put my money there. I like put it online, you know, that kind of thing. But it's happening. But you see, in the same breath, you have a couple of youth who do not have that kind of uh, tech exposure, but there are still opportunities for them that they're not seeing. For example, right now we have the uh, agri. We have so many things we can get into. And we, they just need to be more inspired. Yeah. By not the government alone, but people that are a bit ahead of them in age. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just think that uh, a lot is also happening. Young people are also beginning to teach themselves exactly. the yeah. world of yeah. association. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's the option that we are no should longer push for government that's to it. do that's all it. that. All right. All right. Uh, is suicide really an option? Ejemai asks after the break. When is suicide the only option? Never. Suicide is never the only option. No matter how dark, no matter how bleak, no matter how far, no matter how frustrating, no matter how much, it seems that the future will never be good. Suicide will never, ever be the only option. In our part of the world, suicide is rarely discussed, but unfortunately, 
In today's world, news of people committing suicide is a regular occurrence. My experience with suicide is one I want to share with you today. Have I ever contemplated suicide? No. Have I ever had a close encounter? Yes. I was having a conversation with a dear friend and we discussed the struggle with suicidal thoughts. My friend mentioned that he was having dark thoughts and dark moments and things were just not going the way he expected. And sometimes in 2019, as he was driving on Todd Mainland Bridge, a thought came to him that driving straight into the lagoon would end the hurt, the struggle and the pain. But the thoughts of his family, his children and people that loved him came to mind and he decided that he would keep fighting this battle, knowing that the future will be bright. Today, he's on a better path and things are gradually falling in place. We sat down and had a long conversation about this thing called suicide and how it can creep in on people, even people that we see as strong and courageous. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. When the thoughts drag you in, sucks you in, you lose focus of how good the past was, how the future is just around the corner. The thoughts drag you down and make you lose focus of the door handle, the door that opens to the light. You forget that all you have to do is stretch further. The thoughts keep you in your present state of mind, the present state of mind that is difficult and dark, forgetting that is only a phase. It will surely pass. If only we can find strength, close our eyes and reach a little further, Grab hold of the door handle and pull it down. Open the door and behold the light. During the dark thoughts of suicide, one must remember one's loved ones. You must remember that nothing is permanent in this world. So, nothing bad lasts forever and nothing good also lasts forever. Obstacles are part of the journey. We must look out for them. We must remember that this is something that can creep up on anyone and distract you from your focus. Suicide also hurts those we love the most. Years after a loved one has committed suicide, the family left behind finds it difficult to heal and there is always no closure for them. If anyone is going through this process, I would advise that you reach out to someone that you love or someone you can talk to. A professional can even help you. Please know that you are not alone and you can reach the Lagos State Suicide Helpline. Remember, suicide is never the only option. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> no, um, I take uh, conversations around suicide very personal, and that's because I almost committed suicide in 2013. Oh, dear. And usually when I talk about it, I, yeah. I'm invited to speak about suicide. I like to dwell on the solution. Oh, okay, really? From experience. I want to point out two things okay. that I feel can help somebody escape suicidal thoughts. Okay? The first thing there is that that the person should have a great vision. Now, let me talk about this. Why do most persons commit suicide? Because they are so caught up in the present, present frustration mm -hmm. that they cannot see a future. Mm -hmm. So they don't see a future playing out for them in a favorable position. So you say, nothing is there for me, so let me just die. But this is what vision does for you. Vision keeps your focus in the future. Yeah. So, for instance, I won't have a vision of becoming Nigeria's president. Amen. Okay, assuming. Amen. <laughs> of becoming Nigeria's president. And I believe that God has called me to transform Nigeria. That is the vision. True. When I pass through economic frustration, or maybe I'm heartbroken, or I'm jobless, 
when I match joblessness, being broke or being heartbroken to the vision or the grand vision of becoming a president, I will see that that present frustration is not yeah. enough to jeopardize the future yeah, I have. Yeah. So that is the first thing. The second thing is for people to cultivate a selfless thought pattern. Okay. Most persons yeah, who true. commit suicide are very selfish in their thoughts pattern. It's about sorry, them. Boy, me, me. So I'm half broken. I'm broke. Uh, I don't have this. I don't have that. Yeah. When you that think you know? about other people, family, friends, proteges, your mentors, mother? and all that, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. tendency to I'm commit suicide will be yeah. low. And I think true. adding to your solutions, I, 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 I'm looking at one thing that, listen, every human being needs... We draw strength from two ways. One is internal strength, True. and the one is from the outside. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the internal strength to me comes in two ways. There's a personal one that comes from experience, like the vision you have and everything. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the spiritual. Yeah. Spiritual in the sense that you are, you know, a lot of people will not even contemplate suicide because they feel, how can you take a life? Yeah. It's okay. impossible. Mm -hmm. So their brain is shut down against it. Now, that's from the inside. From the outside is the family. You see, we were not created to live alone. Mm -hmm. Whether you are married or not, you are created to be in a society, mm -hmm. have a group of people, not gossip friends, mm -hmm. but yeah. a group of people that you can rely on. Mm -hmm. You see, there were times in my life where I got so broke. But one thing, I always look at one thing that helped me on was that if anything happened, I would just go back home. I will just go back or go to my parents. If I stay there two years, I know I'll bounce back. Even yeah. Shola is saying where is home. Shola, you're laughing here. Yeah, so. Now, I found that so funny. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, this topic is probably more suited for my son, who is a mental health practitioner. Okay. But I think, you know, from my little experience, I've had, you know, loved ones, you know, cousins, relatives who have, you know, taken their life uh, from suicide. Mm. Uh, so it's it's an area that really you know like it's it's very deep. I mean, I always say that when I when I even look at the methods that they use to commit suicide, if somebody hangs themselves, I'm like thinking, man, that person must be so brave, you know. Yeah. It just really? goes to show yeah. you that Pain. sometimes that people are just at the end of of the road, and the only thing they want to do is send you know go out in like a blaze of smoke, really. Um, mm for somebody to, to, to do those kind of things. But, but Shola, also, I think I it helps when Shola? there's a lot of family support. Like, Kyle yeah. said that he, he can actually go back home. So basically, Kyle is not at the end of the road yet. That's but Shola, you Kyle said something. Have, you, you, you mentioned something. that. For many who commit this time, they don't, they, don't even, they don't see any options. Anything, yeah. But Shola, um, and it, it's sometimes because of the way they've been conditioned as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but you mentioned that you have family, close family, uh, that, uh, yes. you know, have gone out through suicide. And I want to ask, because I don't have somebody so close that has actually gone out like that, what is the healing process like after that for the people left behind after the process? How do they find closure? How do they heal and move on? You know, it, it's the most difficult thing. And this, I think this is one of the things that should be, should be sold to people who are suffering from True? depression. Yeah, the people you live Because I, I remember an episode that happened to me a few years ago. Uh, a cousin, cousin of mine I lost a, a daughter through suicide. And I remember going through the entire ceremony and, you know, the funeral and every, and, and I know her mom, mom was really struggling for answers, you know, really struggling to say why. You know, and you know, it, it, the, the pain that it leaves behind, I think survivors of suicide victims should be made to talk a bit more, more about especially the pain. in a Nigerian society where yeah? people always kind of push everything to the back. That's Honestly, exactly. we really need should, to talk about to suicide more. And of course, I think we're still going to look at this topic and we're probably going to look at it from another angle. Another Maybe way, yeah. um, the people left behind mm. after suicide. I think that's something we really should consider. It is. It, okay? It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's, so, it's important. Yeah. So, so yeah. we'll continue to discuss suicide at least on another date. Mm -hmm. Social media feedback. Esteemed viewer, your contributions are integral to this program. Please keep sharing your thoughts on everything we discuss here on a previous advocacy on the need for boys learning to cook. Otolo Unnewi says, you are right. Boy needs to cook, not only women. I myself also cook, even more than my wife. I love cooking. And it started from when my mother was alive. Beautiful. Emu Owobete says, I love the atmosphere of patriotism in today's show. It only depicts the strong desire to continue fighting for a better Nigeria. Follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, 
plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plus TV Africa.com forward slash the advocate NG. Shalakuti is up next after the break. Every election cycle in Nigeria is usually accompanied by the registration of new political parties. But at the end of the election cycle, the results are often the same, abject failure. In recent times, INEC has attempted to deregister around 74 political parties for failing to meet up with statutory requirements. Every time one talks about politics on social media, the new party or third force advocates, as I call them, are always the loudest, screaming things like, PDP and APC are the same, or we are not voting for PDP or APC in the next election, and so on and so forth. Yet, election after election, the winner is always the devil or the deep blue sea. So in short, PDP and APC. <laughs> While I agree that citizens should be able to register associations, including political parties, freely, it is now beyond doubt that many of these parties are mere inventions purely created to massage the egos of politically lazy individuals who want to ride on the wave of the politicking season to improve their local or national rating, which, to be honest, is not necessarily a bad thing if they were happy to take on the associated costs. But that as it leaves INEC with the bill, we cannot continue to tolerate this. After being a no-show at the polls, all many of the new players want is the pleasure of being referred to as former governorship or presidential candidate of XYZ party. In Nigeria, you know that we just love titles. At the end of the fruitless exercise, the outcome is usually a massive bill. Logistic and legal and management nightmares for the election body INEC, which is funded through very scarce resources by the taxpayer. The small number of citizens who also bought into this vision of a new political awakening are also left quite disillusioned. There is no doubt in my mind that just by glancing at the election results from the last three or four election cycles, that there are only three political parties in Nigeria. There is the PDP, there is the APC, and then there is the rest, which is all the other parties put together. The PDP and APC in every election cycle usually share around 90 to 95% of the total votes cast the rest, well, they share the 5 to 10% along with voided votes. In fact, sometimes voided votes take a bigger chunk than some of the other political parties. To be honest, the new parties just don't have the resources to upstate major political parties in a local election, talk less a national one. I'm not talking about money alone. I'm talking manpower, expertise, reach, media, platforms, membership, everything. I mean, it's, running an election is not a small job. So am I saying that no other political party outside the PDP and APC can win an election in Nigeria? No, I'm not saying that at all. Because we all know that some of the uh, few political parties, other political parties have won elections at local level. So we can agree that it is possible to do so. However, we must not lose sight of the fact that most parties outside the two giants that have succeeded in winning these elections usually field political gladiators who are from the two major parties, but have only left those parties because they were unable to secure their tickets. Every Nigerian that wants to be in the political space and make a difference in the next election cycle in 2023 should choose one of the two major political parties and ensure the better candidate emerges within the two parties. It is certain that one of the two parties will definitely produce the next leadership for the country at all levels. 
For those who will create alternative platform, they should be truthful to their supporters and themselves that this is at least a 16 to 60 year plan and slowly start their journey from the lowest level of local politics and build up from there. INEC needs to be spared the pain of printing voters' cards the size of bed sheets in subsequent elections, just so some lazy politicians can be addressed as your excellency. <laughs> you know, wow. The, I hope I wasn't too good. The, 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 the bed sheet voters card was what actually got me. That's because, it. Well, I think what uh, got me is the need for Hi, I was a one-time presidential aspirant, and I'm like, which country? I like Nigeria. Uh -huh. yeah. oh, I don't yeah. know you. I don't. I, I, I'm not even familiar with your name. Which party? Well, but and I think like, it's really? true because usually when when we get to before elections, you mm. now start seeing all kinds of people coming up with all kinds of political funny visions, yeah. funny names, mm. YPP, ABC, CAC, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, every Exactly. alphabet will start, they start putting it together just to yeah. coin something because yeah. constitutionally you have the right to, yeah. you know, Very register a political soon. party. Mm. And so you can just have, find this group of five, ten friends, can just stay in their room, put money together and just go and register a party mm. and then a causing problem everywhere yeah. just because after the election somebody can answer like Jeremiah said, mm. I was a one-time one presidential, presidential aspirant, aspirant of, like, the, of the largest black population <laughs> in the world. Even if he didn't get any vote, because his own vote <laughs> yeah. was voided. No, the I, I think it's the intention behind yeah. that that, yeah. that bothers me. Yeah. Yeah. Truly, you, you, I'm sorry, Yeah, maybe like Shola said, they're actually lazy politicians. Because if, you are, if your heart is in the right place and you want to make changes to the Nigerian society and uh, economy, then of course you should... First of all, align yourself with the possibility of winning yeah, a true. position. Then begin to find that opportunity to make a difference, mm. not go and add yourself to SPD. And uh, most I, I think, I think the so, major problem uh, we have okay. is that a lot of time, yeah. when we get, we, we, we get the idea of party politics wrong. Yeah. Because most of the time when we say party, we're setting up a party to vie for presidential candidacy, which is not the ultimate. If you really want to make a change, change starts from the grassroots. grassroots. Yeah. So if you, yeah. I don't mind having 200,000 political parties. Yeah. As long as out of the 200,000, only two or three or five are vying for presidential yeah. and the rest are local. Because yeah. listen, if for example, we're talking about APC today, but it started by fighting for Lagos. Mm. Then it went to Ogun, sure. then it went to Ekiti and all those places. Abga today is still struggling in the East. Yeah. So by the time we build all these regional quote unquote blocks, or even some I just said to remain in a local government. In some parts of the world, yes, you some don't parties do your, will not go beyond you maybe so a fellow do or something. And they're just there. The yeah. They and, just keep and pumping. Back to whatever I, I, I agree with um, the premise of what we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. And I can relate with the analysis, okay? But I want to come from a reverse perspective in this case. Mm. And that is the option of always having to choose between the devil and the and deep, deep blue sea. Okay, mm. Now, I think it's about time or we should be getting ready as Nigerians to start doing the right thing. Let me give an example. In the last general election, so we had Atiku for PDP, Buhari for APC, we had Moralo for YPP, mm -hmm. Drew, Toyo and them coming together. So you hear a vast majority of young people say, I prefer Moralo, but he will not he win, will not so win. let me <laughs> vote <laughs> Atiku. <laughs> this one says, I prefer Feladu Ritoye, but because he will not win, let <laughs> me vote, vote Atiku. Yeah, so exactly. that is problematic. Mm. The reason it is problematic is that, let's understand that PDP and APC are the same party, the same people. All the people that are in APC today were once in PDP. Have been going back so the home. best we can get are recycled politicians. No, they are not recycled, they are on loan, you know, in football. Okay. Loan <laughs> 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 no, no politicians. Yeah, exactly. no so, because in the next general election, you discover that the next president is probably going to be a former vice president, a former governor, or former senator. Mm. And these are the same group of people that have been messing up Nigeria. Within because this... I believe that the Nigerian political space needs fresh air. But the way to achieve that is for the masses to come together. Because people don't vote because they believe the election can easily be rigged. But I say this thing, we need numbers to manipulate the numbers. If you have a 2 million vote gap, you cannot manipulate it. Or, it. or 20 million, That's you cannot it. manipulate it. So the masses have to come out and stand behind the right person. Else, 
forever and ever will have to choose between the devil, devil and, and the deep blue sea, and that's a terrible option. We're, we're enjoying where we are. I think that's where we're not yeah, ready no, to it's change. It's okay. We can be where we are, but we can come together and use our numbers, like you say, to effect changes in the PDP that we mm. see. To effect changes in the APC that we see, uh, that we have, exactly. I, I don't necessarily believe yeah. that we need a new political party. Yeah. Yeah. What I believe I, we need is that we need to galvanize our strength, galvanize our, our our numbers, and tell APC that APC, guess what? We're going to support you, but in return, we want a fresh candidate. Exactly. And I believe that APC will. Exactly. Want I think I think one of the mistakes we make is always this assumption that oh that there is um, that if the young people come together and vote a particular candidate, it's going to win the election. The young people are not in the villages. Like I said, I've been in politics for more than 20 years. I've gone to so many campaigns, so many villages. I can't even remember what they are called. I've done campaigns around at least 32 out of the 36 uh, states in the country and the FCT. You know, so the point I, I always tell people is that you see, you've got to understand that for you to get a candidate that can deliver a national or a statewide election, that candidate must be able to campaign effectively. I'm not saying just visiting these places for a day or two must be known in the nooks and crannies of Nigeria, in those places where he wants to win the election. And he must have representatives in every single polling unit across the state. When you think that Lagos State has more than 8,000 polling units on its own, how, how many people, how many, I don't know 8,000 people that can put in those polling units. Because you know don't what? forget the, poll, the people in the polling units must come from that area as well. It is you, a you difficult know, you know thing. What? So it's what, not what? just a pretty face. Or a PhD. Yeah, Shola. <laughs> but you know what, Shola? Shola. You know, <laughs> it's so good to you. you know what? This is what Nigeria does to you. It gets you talking and talking and talking. Sure. And we won't have time yeah. to do the next one. Let's go over to the next uh, okay, advocacy. Yeah. Kingsley is about to point out who Nigeria's enemy is. So stay tuned. Nigeria and Nigerians have a common enemy. Politically speaking, only two tribes exist, the rich and the poor. And there are only two religious extremes, the wealth extreme and the poverty extreme. The elites know this very well, but the masses don't. Nigeria's political elites may be incompetent about governance, but they are definitely competent about incompetence and politicking. Through the instrumentality of systematic indoctrination, and divisive religious and tribal sentiments, they have strategically maintained their grip on power despite their crass incompetence, impunity, and corruption. The average Northern Muslim grows up believing he was born to rule, and that the only enemy he must overcome is the infidel, and that is the Southern Christian. The average Yoruba man grows up believing that he has to get rid of Omoibo, who is occupying his land and monopolizing the businesses therein. Why the average Igbo man like me grows up believing that the Hausa man doesn't want his existence and would easily partner with the Yoruba man to achieve that. However, from my experiences, some of the most supportive people around me are from the North and West. Now, when they teach us history, they teach us conveniently doctored and regional historical perspectives. The Igbos are taught that the Biafran genocide happened because Igbos simply demanded their own nation as a way of forestalling the marginalization and massacres of Igbos in the north. The Hausa Fulanese are taught that the war happened because the Igbo caucus connived and executed the massacre of northern elites. And the Yorubas are taught that the Igbo man will never trust or love him because of the betrayal role Awolowo supposedly played in the failure of the Biafran mood. move. Now, instead of admitting that the war was avoidable and was a result of the egotism and parochial interests of our rulers, they forced the masses into believing that tribal differences necessitated this war, which is wrong. What then is the consequence? Why the rulers reveal the masses are divided by parochial regional interests? And that jeopardizes our sense of objectivity, merit, and nationhood during national elections. The Northerner would rather vote the, Northern, the worst Northerner than vote an Easterner. The Westerner would prefer to pander to the North when he can't be in power than risk an Easterner. And the Easterner prefers to leave the Union than vote the Northern or Western option. And the Southerners would often pander to the East. Nevertheless, there is still hope for Nigeria. But it will start materializing when the masses realize that we have a common enemy, and that is our rulers. We also need to realize that the ruling class is strengthened by our unity and would do anything to jeopardize it. 
This was clearly demonstrated in the Arabic crackdown of the NSAS protests. And very importantly, we need to realize that our political elites are united in their oppression and suppression of the masses, and that PDP and APC are the same party. The ruling is, however, different. <laughs> Nothing else can be truth about the, who our enemy is. We already know who our enemy is, but uh, what actually struck me is you know, how they are threatened by our unity. And I keep saying it, that the NSAS was the very first time since my own existence that I could see everybody, despite religion, where you are from, origin, background, qualification, whatever, everybody came together for the first time, and it never mattered where you are from. It never mattered your tribe. It never mattered your religion. Things were working. It became like a nation of its own. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it just lasted. sprung up in different People parts were, of the country. There, there was food. Nobody complained of hunger. There were medical uh, medication, mm. health care. There were legal services of a three of genius. Just within a few, a free period, it was a nation of its own. So I really, really believe that. I mean, these guys are threatened by an, our unity. And the best way to really achieve their aim is to ensure that these guys are still apart. Because mm -hmm. provided they come together, yeah. it's a very big change. problem. It, it reminds me of, of an advocacy we had a few weeks ago where we talked about uh, um, everybody being a victim. Whether you are Igbo, you're Yoruba, you're a teacher, you're a police, yeah. you're a citizen, you're jobless, you have a job, you're a civil servant, we're all victims. Yeah. Because whatever we are going through was dictated by a group of people yeah. who have decided to just make us feel you are better than this person. Yeah. And until, like rightly said, until we come to that realization, and that is where I, I, it baffles me, that even in the era, in the 80s and the 70s, where there was no internet, where people didn't have access to information, they tend to understand things better than we are now, yeah. than we do now. Now we have access to information. Yeah. You can Google, yes. you have, yeah. I've downloaded Emotions so many and, documents and from, uh, yes, from, the from online about the Igbo Biafra, the civil war. It's yeah. a Nigeria war. And I've seen so many angles. I mean, you download, you see what is happening in the North. And for example, when people say the North is, is destroying Nigeria, I tell them that, listen, if any sensible president comes into power today, and wants Nigeria to be good, he has to focus on investing in the North. Yes. Because they don't yes. have anything. Yes. Look at all the kidnappings that is happening. Education, because a lot of the schools are in the outskirts. The schools don't have walls. You see model colleges and I'm like, this one is a model college in the yeah. North. And we accuse the North and they had the number. Of ripping us out. You know, I always say that one thing in Nigeria is that the politicians weaponize poverty and illiteracy. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And yes. Don't educate them yeah. so that you can move them in the direction they want. Put support. religion there and divide them exactly. apart. Put um, exactly. ethnicity and, and throw them support. apart. Yeah. But when you come to the offices, yeah, when you go to the markets, yeah. when you go to the grassroots, we are all together in yeah. this. Oh, Even sure, Shola sure. knows that when <laughs> he gets to wherever he is. There is the, I want you are a Nigerian. Bros, bro, we are together. So, so but when you come home, you find this you line find, that exactly. are literally exactly. not supposed to Tell be us there. your experience. What do you think? Let's hear from you. What your do you view. think about I this? think, I think you know, it's funny because uh, even though I'm a southerner, my best friends are from all, all parts of the country. Absolutely. The the north. And it's always so funny for me when we are having these, these discussions because, um, you know, they, they actually mean nothing. When you think about it really in the sense of the word, when somebody does a transaction with you, you don't care, you know, whether they are from the north or from the east. If you are going to sell a property to somebody for hundreds of millions of naira, you wouldn't be like, oh, I'm not selling to this person because it's from this part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is the this is the thing that that I find a bit, you know, frustrating about Nigeria is that we conveniently find these escape routes mm. when we, things are not working out for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when things are working out great for us, our best friends are we're all. Anyway. What's that word? The tribalized Nigerians. Absolutely. You know? I just wish that we we would go beyond just saying things. It's the same thing we said about religion. We go beyond just yeah. saying things and start to do and more. Start to do them and yeah. show people like proper. You know the way things should be properly done. Hmm. Yeah, let, I, let me keep I, this I thing before you wrap up. Right, that uh, it, it's so bad that you see right now, in terms of insecurity, we are saying, oh, all these people are coming from Niger, Niger, Niger. But you know, as of today. A lot of people still take the local security guards, megads, from Niger. Thank yeah. you, my that, that, that is how yeah. you know that in our mind, yeah. we don't really care where you come from. Yeah. We just want solutions. Yeah. Because I, where I live, mm. uh, well, 
we happen to own the property. We are Yorubas. Mm. We have a tenant, two young ladies, beautiful, hardworking girls, hardworking mm. girls. They are, the, they are in our BQ. They are Igbos. And our security man that lives in, beside the BQ, he's an also man. No, and no, you we, know were, what? we wake up in the morning, we're living in the house, and everybody's just saying, uh, Baba Zachary, have a good deal. Ah, who's our maker? Take care, bye. <laughs> There's nothing like, you, uh, you I think, know? I think this is a political machination. <laughs> No, our politicians may not understand governance, but they know politics. They know, politics. Yes. They know yes. as long as we are remain divided along political, religious, and tribal lines, they can have their way. Yeah. For yeah. instance, if an incompetent northerner is coming to power, the average northerner who is not exposed, we vote him regardless of how incompetent he is, as long as he's a northern mm -hmm. Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, so they continue to sponsor yeah. those sentiments. Well, yeah, yes, because those sentiments benefit them and elongate their stay in power. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I just think, wish there is a way that the poor masses, that the masses we can realize to tell that, see, we that are one we are one. You know, no, this we advocacy, are one this, this program together. is one of the ways to educate them. Mm. But what is even more scary to me is that rather than watch this, a lot of the people that are concerned, that are badly hit, will go watch other entertainment programs. Tracking. Because they don't understand, <laughs> that's it. They don't understand the value. You, I mean, you hear people say, uh, election no concern me. And I'm yeah. like, how? How, how can yeah. you say election? Uh, that determines your before, future. Before, before, before you wrap up, is that we also need to start understanding that we are different and not better. And I'm saying that because of from mm. what he said. Yeah. We need to start really realizing that we are different from each other. Yes. If I was born in the North, and I have that environmental influence from the north, I will not behave anything less like, than mm, what they are doing. Mm, yeah. So the fact that you are born in a different place completely make you different. And you, so you shouldn't despise the other person. They yeah. grew up as a result of what, you know, their upbringing, mm -hmm. their culture, their, the culture mm. and all those things. Uh, we need to really start understanding that because, if, because you guys understand that you are different, it yeah, makes you to appreciate your similarities, yeah. diversities, and uniqueness. Rather than drive yeah. us apart, you yeah. should bring us together. together. Well, time is never our friend on this program. Never. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com slash the advocate ng. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station, let's keep advocating for a better society. See ya. Bye. 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 Bye.